one of our virtual events. We have an amazing guest today, uh, Mr. Joe D. Hernandez, and everybody knows him as Little Joe with La, in La Familia. Um, we are thrilled to have him with us for this Hispanic Heritage Month event. Um, I, I don't even know where to start. Welcome, sir. Welcome so much. And um, we just have a whole bunch of questions that we would like to ask you. You ready for them? Yes, buenos dias to one and all. And uh, thank you for having me up. And I hope that uh, you'll enjoy this as much as I'm going to. All right, wait till I ask the questions. You may not be happy about it. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. All right, well, um, I read your book. In fact, everyone go out and read his book because he was so gracious to give our library a copy of it. Um, it it's just amazing. It is the life story of um, Mr. J uh, Mr. Joe there, a little Joe. And um, so this is where I've got a lot of our questions from. Plus, I've pretty much stalked you on YouTube and <laughs> watched everything else <laughs> about your life in the last month. So, um, so music, music has been in your family for generations. Um, you know, with your great uncle uh, playing the violin to you yourself taking up the guitar at age six. After reading your book, it seems like music was equated in all the generations as both the way to tell your life stories and to share hope. How do you see music? Well, for one, music to me is magic. That's the only way I can describe it. Um, when I get to perform it in front of the audience, it's the time that I feel totally just free. Um, it uh, just, it, I, I, I've always said to me, it's magic. You know, it's the only art form that uh, can make a little baby move or you know jump up and down and a 99 year old person tap their feet and you know it just touches music is from the soul and it reaches the soul uh, and it doesn't matter in what language or what genre of music uh, i believe because we have that heartbeat and that's how the music beats it just moves us physically and uh, i think soul wise uh, we share something Humanity, all humanity, I believe, shares uh, something in common when it comes to music. Uh, it's the soul, it's the feeling. And music has been in my uh, family. Well, my grandmother, my father's mother, was a uh, trained piano pianist. So her children, my uncles and aunts, they all played instruments and sang and wrote songs. And uh, there was that party atmosphere in my dad's home all the time with uh, his uh, brothers and compadres. So uh, as far back as I can remember, uh, as a very, very young child, the music was always there. And uh, this just part of my whole family, my brothers and sisters, uh, they're all, um, all my brothers sing better than I. I'm just, I guess, a little better businessman. But uh, the music is, as I say, it's just magic. And it's definitely um, a wonderful family tradition in your family. Thank you. Um, speaking of your family, um, you and your family struggled for generations. You faced poverty, uh, prejudice, um, and, and one of the things, the stories that struck me was that your schools would not let you, let you bring your home tacos for lunch um and you've also faced excruciating work in the cotton fields in a very young age um you began driving your family to work across texas um at what age 15 <laughs> to do dangerous hard work but i was struck by the fact that you never seem to forget your upbringing um, how has this 
you know, your career been affected and your music been affected by this hard struggle and, and the struggles that your family faced? Like, do you see that in your music and your political causes? Well, I think um, that I'm fortunate uh, to be able to stay grounded and be who I've been from the beginning of being who I am. Um, as as uh, poor as we were, uh, I personally, and I don't think anyone in my family ever felt that we were poor because we had the love of one another, brothers and sisters, uncles, aunts, cousins, parents and grandparents, just a huge tribe that, uh, you know, we were all poor, we all shared. So we, me personally, I never felt, I knew I was poor, uh, but I became, of course, a lot more aware of it as I got older. Uh, I understand that, uh, you know, if you're poor, uneducated, and a minority uh, person of color, there's three strikes. It's already, you know, you know you're, you're against the grain. But um, I love people and uh, playing music and entertaining them by something so special for me and the feedback, the energy that they produce for me uh, just makes me whole. Uh, so um, I've been a very, very fortunate person to have traveled different parts of the world and have met so many wonderful people from all walks of life. And I love to listen to people uh, everybody has an idea and an opinion. Every coin has two sides. Uh, I like to think that I try and stay balanced about everything I do in life. Uh, so coming from the environment that produced me, I think uh, for me, I believe that <clears throat> that's an advantage to so many people that have never had to struggle or really fight for survival because as time goes on, you not only learn to appreciate everything and everyone, but uh, I never feel threatened. There's nothing that unless you're gonna physically harm me, but uh, you know, losing material things or, I mean, that's, that's no threat to me. Uh, of course, I don't want to go back to picking cotton because the machines took that away from me. <laughs> and I remember when they first were introduced to the cotton fields. But um, again, uh, I'm just a cotton picker that uh, do music on the side. And uh, I recognize, understand, and, and connect with millions of people that come from the um, the environment that I come from and it breaks my heart that so many are still there, specifically the farm workers whom uh, I've dedicated as much time and effort to make it better for them as I can. And I'm still on call at any time they need anything that I can assist with, I'm there. Well, I, I'm going to skip over then when you when you talked about, you know, the, the rights, the human activist rights, and I'm going to go back to your music. I promise you I'm going to ask you a question about your music. No problem. Um, but with, um, with helping the farm workers and victims of police injustice, you, you became friends with Cesar Chavez and met, met with presidents. You, you wrote history. In, in terms of fighting for people who may not be able to defend themselves. Um, you've also served as, as a mentor and a speaker to encourage education. Um, there's something that you wrote, uh, a line you wrote in the book that said, education is the great equalizer that we need. Do you believe that education and music is a great equalizer for everyone, no matter where you came from or your struggles. I truly do believe that um, education is being informed 
education is a tool that we can use to communicate, uh, which is in the human race, one of the most important things that we need to do to communicate with, with one another. Um, I'm not a great speaker per se. I talk a lot and sometimes don't say a whole lot, but uh, I truly understand the need of a good education because I don't have one. I dropped out of the seventh grade and uh, I know uh, how really difficult life can be without an education. As I said, the means to communicate with one another is so important. And uh, I know in my younger days, I passed up on some opportunities because I just didn't have the vocabulary to communicate with and I was embarrassed to uh, and sometimes do some uh, TV shows that I was invited to. I, I was intimidated. And to begin with, I was just a very timid kid. Uh, uh, I'm real shy. So one of the biggest obstacles I had to overcome was that shyness, which I still am. I talk a lot because I'm shy. But uh, getting in front of audience uh, was really hard to do. But I knew that when I started and when my dad was in prison and I could make a uh, little money performing, uh, that was more difficult than uh, meeting uh, my uh, shyness and overcoming it. You know, uh, the human spirit can overcome so many obstacles and sometimes we don't know or understand that and because when we have we have the opportunity to do so we don't uh for whatever excuses we make but uh for me i didn't have the excuses weren't going to work i had to do what i had to do and uh it just i really truly believe that if you meet all obstacles head on you it's like swinging at the ball you you know, you're not always going to hit it every time, but how great when you do hit it, you know, and if you hit it so well, it makes up for all the times you missed it. So uh, I think that um, I was given uh, a great destiny or a journey to follow and do what I do, because one of the best things I think is that uh, I get out of my work is that I'm able to help others uh, through it because of music. And uh, to me, that uh, is one of the greatest feelings of, you know, um, being able to help others because I know how it feels when people care enough to, to help. And it's that part of helping that it's, of course, if it's money or whatever it is that you're given, that's highly appreciated. But the fact that someone cares enough to do for you, uh, for me, that's that's the ultimate. I, I totally can see your heart in your music. I um, started listening to your music you know i started reading about the you know the eclectic sound and they wanted to hear it and what struck me was the emotion that you elicited with every song you you could feel your heart you could feel the pain you could feel the joy whatever it was that you were singing about touched people's lives and um so yes whatever your destiny or your journey has been it has been to change this world and um i know you probably are like no 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 because you know you, i get a lot of humility from you but um I, I i felt that myself i sat and watched one of your videos with tears coming down in my eyes and um, what well, the best part was, was it was in Spanish and I had no clue what you were saying. I know un poquito. 
Well, as I said, it's about the soul. It's about feeling, you mm. know. Um, it's that communication between the souls. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, um, I love to see people have a good time because while that's happening, they can forget their sorrows, their problems, you know. And uh, it is something special to see grown uh, men and women crying. Um, the songs remind them of their loved ones that they've lost or that are, aren't near them. Um, but it's it's not the language. It's uh, it's the music. It's it's the magic of music. Well, and speaking of music, um, you, as you were talking about, you know, having this open mind, this old thought, there's two sides. Your music had about eight sides. <laughs> you, <laughs> you, you basically took a little bit of everything and put it in your music. Um, do you want to <laughs> tell us about that journey? <laughs> well, um, I call it, it's my capirotada. Um, well, it was capirota in English, I think it's a, maybe it's sweet bread or, you know, it's made with raisins, cheese and it's, bread and milk. And, it's gumbo from my it, culture. It's gumbo, a little bit of everything. Actually, it's a gumbo capirota, yes. Um, and, uh, uh, because I love all kinds of music, uh, I was fortunate to grow up in an era when the jazz, the big band era, uh, and all the crooners, all the uh, uh, just marvelous singers. And th that's who I listened to as a kid. And as the music continues, each generation brings their own mix to the table. And as it continues to uh, evolve, uh, I'm fortunate enough to see it. For me, it's gone full circle. Uh, I, I dabbled in all genres because, because I, I feel I can do it. And uh, I could never play a concert with, in just one genre of music or one language. It would bore me, I'd bore myself to death. Uh, but that capirotada serves to attract different ages and races of people. Uh, and it all goes back to that magic that makes you, makes you want to shake the old body. <laughs> but it's, that's my, that's my toss up salad. It's a mixture uh, of uh, different uh, ingredients, different uh, styles and genres of music. It, uh, it's worked for me and I started that way as a kid and now, uh, uh, I continue to perform that way, uh, and I guess as long as it continues to draw an audience who's willing to sit there. I mean, what's so amazing is like I go to the, perform the shows and I see people stand in line to get into the concerts for hours. I would never do that for me to go watch me. Oh God! Uh, but the, the and you know they're. They're all talking and meeting and, and, you know, just big conversation going on, you know, and the doors open and they rush in and they still that excitement before the show. So, you know, all of that is just feeding me energy and stuff. And that magic, it doesn't matter if I've not slept, uh, you know, I've gone on stage, curtain goes up and the band strikes, magic happens and you know, it, it just, it's just amazing. Uh, uh, and as I was saying, the people take the energy and throw it right back at me. Uh, and it's just so fulfilling. It's just, so who said I was ever poor? I can't imagine you would ever be bored. And I totally agree because I'm a people watcher. And so when I was watching your YouTube videos, I looked at the audience and everyone had this big, amazing smile and you were on the stage with your hat and 
you were just I can see you were whipping them up and they were whipping you up and it was just one big if you know amazing ex shared experience so you definitely have a gift and you're extremely humble about that gift <laughs> but others see it others see it yes well yes. the biggest gift i think is being able to fake it i'm not all that i'm made out to be musically i have terrible meter the time gets terrible but i was told as a kid just fake it till you make it and you watch me i'm gonna make it one of these days you have definitely yeah. made it but <laughs> Let me ask you a question, and I hope this is okay to ask. Um, Anything. Uh, okay. Um, you you pretty much made a promise to your late brother, Jesse, that you would follow your heart into the music field. Um, do, do you ever look back and think what your life would have been like had you not, you know, made that promise to your brother? Good question. <clears throat> I don't think I've ever stopped long enough to consider that, give it a thought. Uh, now you got me wondering, <laughs> what would it have been like? What would have I done? Uh, I, I really don't have an answer that uh, I can give you uh, because I'm not one much to look back at the past because I'm so busy and excited about something new happening day after day after year after year. But that promise I made to my brother, uh, I carried the, that promise with me till the day uh, when I won my first Grammy and one of my older brothers, my mentor, Morfidio, uh, told me, well, you know, um, you made Jesse a promise and uh, you fulfilled it. This is the highest recognition, the highest award you can get from your peers. And I gave it consideration and thought about it. And I, I, I thought, I, I kind of felt like a burden had been lifted. I, I, I really did keep my promise. But in one, one show, we played uh, the Majestic Theater in San Antonio, along with the symphony, the whole orchestra, about 80 piece orchestra, my band and a mariachi group of like 12 people and dancers. There were 122 people on stage. It's just amazing. At the end of the show, I would, I, I played uh, Las Nubes and uh, that magic was so powerful. But I realized that the top, the pinnacle for the different strokes for different folks. But for me, that first night, I, the realization that there I was, my band being accompanied with the orchestra and the finale with the mariachi, everybody got involved playing my song. And I thought, this is really, for me, this is making it, taking it to the top for my brother. The awards have been plentiful and every one of them appreciated. Uh, hundreds of them and they're all appreciated. But that was an incredible reward for my work after all these years to perform with the symphony, mariachi, my band and the dancers. And I thought this is the top for me, it may not mean much or anything to others, but for me, I thought I have finally got to the place that I didn't even know that I could be. It's just an amazing, amazing uh, two night show that we played with the uh, symphony. Well, uh, you you are definitely amazing. I I um I couldn't put your book down because seeing the determination the hope the love the believing in miracles that you exhibited which you keep saying magic yes you you believe in miracles and 
it shows that you believe in this. Um, let me ask you a question. Um, there are a lot of people in the world that have situations. Um, I myself came from a, um, you know, homeless years and years and years. And um, sometimes it's really, really easy. The easy rep is to just say, well, the world's out to get me. I don't have any hope. Um, I, I, I can't do it. What like advice or what what would you tell someone who's saying well i've got you know uh culture against me education against me people against me what would an encouraging thing be that you would share with them if that's okay to ask well i'm sure it's different for everyone but we find ourselves in similar situations um for me, I've never felt hopelessness, no matter what. Um, but I, I know that was because, has been because of family. There's always been family. I'm seven of 13 kids right in the middle. And uh, I've always had that love and support. So no matter what or where, or when things happen, uh, I never felt hopeless. Uh, there was always ganas, which wanting to, to to do to achieve. Because my biggest, uh, I guess, <clears throat> concern was to look after the family when my dad went to prison at 55 and I was 15 years old, um, I had six siblings to look after and uh, I was too busy trying to uh, do what I could uh, really to survive. And um, that's when music popped in and a little extra money. My first show I got paid $5 in 1955 in camera and I played was called a sop hop that we have in schools. $5, I had to pick 500 pounds at a penny a pound to make $5, to earn $5. Of course, 25 cents could get you into a movie for nine cents. One penny would buy you two pieces of caramel candy and 10 cents a full loaded hot dog, five cents for a drink with what a quarter. I could have all that. So $5 could, buy a lot of groceries for the family. So I never felt uh, hopelessness, as I was saying, because there is always hope mañana. Mañana, uh, uh, my dad always said, mañana Dios dirá, tomorrow God will say. And uh, my mom was very faith. Uh, she had a great faith. And she believed. She was, I call, I, my dad was my hero and all, but it was really my mother who really kept the whole thing together. She was really the, the unspoken hero. Uh, she loved every one of us unconditionally and equally. So that was my case. In other cases, some people, so many, unfortunately, don't have that. They don't have family. Uh, what advice I would give them, I would say, make a family. I don't mean go out and get married and make a family, but there are friends around that are wanting to help, allow them to help you, you know, let, let them, they want you to cry on their shoulder, take advantage of that opportunity, be close to people. And, uh, there's always someone that cares. You don't have to feel alone. You don't have to be alone, you know. Uh, and if you find yourself in a desperate situation, get out in a crowd. Do not isolate yourself. Uh, be around people and look at other people's problems. You know, they will say, and I don't have any shoes. Look over there, the guy doesn't have any legs. You know, that's 
that's the true case. Uh, but I understand also mental health. Um, I have many friends, many veterans, especially from the Vietnam era, uh, uh, and that um, have suffered or their families uh, have suffered greatly because of, of mental problems. But it's just not veterans alone. I mean, children, the elderly, and the worst thing that we can do for any person, any human being, is to isolate them, to leave them alone. We got to communicate with them, you know, even at times when they don't want that communication. But I think that's great medicine. And if you can believe in yourself, you know, just believe that you, you can do, or at least believe enough to try to do what you want done. You know, just try. Uh, for years, I sang the old song, you can make it if you try. You know, it was a love motto for the school kids. Uh, you can make it if you try and make education your high. Uh, I push that on the kids uh, through posters and the song. And, but we need to desperately assist the people that find themselves by themselves and are, you know, in a desperate situation, but we have to recognize it. And uh, I see people out on the street sitting there, and the least I can do is walk by them and say, hey, hello, how are you doing? Don't even have to stop, just, and they'll look up and say, well, somebody spoke to me. You know, and they, I know how it feels to be looked down upon. And I, I have been there, I come from that. So anytime you see any person anywhere, if you can at least recognize them, just say hello, how are you? Wish them a good day. It means something to them. You know, again, that human communication, you know, uh, it's needed desperately by these people. Uh, we can all do our share to help, and we should, because it's so very little to do, really, and it's just a kind word. I thoroughly agree. It just says you're not invisible. You matter. Right. Your um, your values. Your, your amazing ethics, your ability to um, share. Do, do you feel that a lot of your, um, you know, the, the value system that you have, uh, you said came from your mother. Um, do you believe that you or this is a bigger La Familia that you were grew up with the sense of caring about others because your family cared. Do you feel that your music, your life, your political activism is an extension of who you were as a child and um, in your family? I do. Because my dad would always, uh, here's an example. If we'd come home, say with an apple, and there's three or four other kids. And if you didn't want to share, you know, on your own voluntarily, just share, take the apple away from you. And they cut it up on four, cut it up four pieces. Give them their piece and give you the smallest piece. <laughs> and it's funny, but uh, you grew up, you grew up uh, uh, with those ethics. And uh, even today, you know, uh, I will always share first before, in, and and they shower us with kindness and goodness. Uh, the uh, the fans are just amazing people. Every every weekend, every tour I go off, I come back with gifts of all sorts of gifts, handmade gifts and some jewelry. They're always just wanting to give, but uh, I always uh, I played a 
a beautiful reception of well, the 50th anniversary, and it was really blush and everything. So the, the gentleman that, uh, that celebrating their anniversary uh, spoke to my road manager and he gave me a big tip. Uh, it was like I already charged him enough, but he was kind and he gave me the tip. So next day when you're on the bus and I just gave everybody split the tip between the band. And what's, the new guys that have brought, they don't understand it yet, you know. They said, what does Joe want? Why did he give us this money? <laughs> my manager told him, no, just, he got a tip, so he thought you should get one too. But uh, that's the way I was brought up, you know. That was my dad's doing, you know. Uh, just share, you know. Uh, and never be greedy. Uh, he despised laziness and greediness. He just, don't be lazy. You know, you, you got to understand from the day you're born, you, there's an effort even to eat, and you're going to work the rest of your life. How hard you work and for whom you work, that's up to you. You're not a plant. You can always move around, but do your work as best you can. Do things the right way. You don't have to do them again. Or and, uh, just advice like that. That you know, when you're a kid, yeah, you hear, yeah, yeah. I don't want to give us our chores and uh, and he said, do it right because if we don't, you got to come back and do it again. And in Spanish, you would say, "El pendejo trabaja doble." The idiot works twice. <laughs> so. It's, you know, I'm an 81 year old man now, but I still go by those uh, rules or, you know, because uh, they work. <laughs> they definitely work. I have to ask you what was your absolute favorite show or thing that you've ever done? God. Done, I can't tell you that. <laughs> my favorite, Legally. favorite thing I've done, uh, my favorite show, uh, the last show I played, uh, and I could almost say that it was just an incredible show. I had my brothers with me, but uh, uh, my first show in Japan was uh, really amazing to me because I had wrote, I had read the book Shogun. I was in New York with my uh, my, one of my attorneys, my music attorney, but, uh, and uh, it was my birthday, and we went to the Lone Star Cafe, and Johnny Rodriguez was performing there, and I met with him after the show, and we, and then on, we're in Manhattan, we're walking back to to the hotel, and um, my attorney Mike Pellison, who's in the book, says, "Joe, uh, I want to give you a gift uh, for your birthday." I said, "Fine." So, because we're walking down, and the store was over, the bookstore. So he went and bought me Shogun, the book. Uh, and may have been 79, I don't remember. But 610 pages, I said, I'm not a great reader. I said, mm, okay, thank you, Mike. Uh, I'm not going to read this book. But <clears throat> we had dinner, and I went to the hotel room, and I opened the book and started reading. I was so fascinated by it, the Japanese culture and just the story in that. It was so amazing to me. Uh, and uh, next day I had to fly from New York to Seattle and the promoter was going to pick me up uh, and we were going to meet with, I forget whom, but we're going to have a quick lunch. It, it's a six hour flight, so it's going to be a late lunch. I left early. Um, and I read the book all the way, all those six hours. And when I got there, I'm such a liar. I, I told him, I have such a bad stomach ache. I'll pass up on the lunch. I wanted to get back to the book. And I just loved the, the book. And that was 14 years before I went to Japan. And I made plans. I'm going to go to Japan. I'm going to go to Japan. I told my manager at that time. Um, why don't you look into uh, flights just to go to a festival in Japan? Or, 
And then I heard about Julio Iglesias selling millions of albums all over the world. And Japanese, the Japanese people just love Julio. And I thought, wow, I want to go play Japan. And it took me 14 years to get to Japan to perform. And I played what was like their uh, World's Fair in Kumamoto, Japan. And it was my first show. We played three or four nights, I forget, two shows a night. And I was so, I, it was just, I have to say that was my best, uh, maybe not my best performance, but one of the show, the show that I really, really remember and appreciate in um, Kumamoto, Japan, my first show. And uh, it was so amazing. But I guess this is a, a, an example of, you can make it if you try. I just, you know, I, I knew I wanted to go to Japan. I knew I wanted to, you know, meet Japanese people and, and eat their food and, and enjoy their culture. And uh, it took 14 years, but I got there and it was so amazing. I, I made probably another three, four trips to Japan. I got to tour all over Japan and it's just um, so amazing. And, and if today I still, you know, um, think about, at one point I even thought, you know what? I mean, at one point I'm not gonna be able to do this any longer. I'm gonna move to Japan. I, I wanna live here. It's only a 14 hour flight, uh, but I, I, I just love the country and the people so much that, uh, I, you know, I was just so amazed that enriched my life that I learned many things about the Japanese culture that um, helped me uh, with myself and their beliefs, how they think and treat each other. Um, one tourist, we stayed like 19, 20 days and I just get so calm, you know, and uh, you just, everybody's so nice to one another. And then I get back to the States, we were at land in Los Angeles, and the manager opened the door of the plane, ah, nah, 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 and the cursing and shouting, and I was oh, God. <laughs> Good old American culture. But, <laughs> but I am just, like I keep repeating, I, I'm very, very, like a very fortunate person. I'm, I'm, and I just wish I could share all my good fortune with everyone. Well, you do. You do in your music. In fact, I'm now going to have to look to see if there's some Japanese music mixed into your, your list now. <laughs> Amazing. Not just, throw, added that in? Just quickly, two kids, you, you'll find it in YouTube. Two kids, one playing the guitar and the other one singing. My song, Las Nubes, in English and Spanish, and they do that, the Japanese, uh, they can copy any, anything. They, they got mariachi, they got the accordion conjunto, and they've got these two kids, it was on YouTube, and uh, I just blew my mind, they're, they're singing Las Nubes, because uh, I do it in Spanish and English, and this kid's doing that, a Japanese kid is like, whoa, <laughs> just amazing culture. So you've pretty much touched the entire world. Can you, well. <laughs> does that blow your mind that, you know, you, you started off picking cotton and now you've got the whole world here? Well, uh, let me see. I picked enough cotton to make enough clothes to be sold around the world. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think you have. I got a couple of stitches here and there around the world. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Well, you are, or you are a gift. Um, you are a gift. I know, you know, you, you're humble at the same time and don't see the gift <laughs> as much. I'm so glad that you were able to take in at that Grammy awards that this, this is something that you know, you did, and you did it um, because you never did give up. And um, 
that I says still, a lot. I still feel repos responsible for the family, you know, not just my siblings, but my children, my grandchildren, and my eight great grandchildren. I was going to ask you <laughs> how many you have. We have your granddaughter helping us today. Oh yeah, she's a jewel. She's a uh, she handles all the media for me. As I said, and I wasn't kidding, and I'm not kidding. I don't know how to turn on the, this contraption here. <laughs> I I barely handle the phone and not well, but uh, you know, I I just decided that I didn't want to learn to deal with it. And I that I'm not on Facebook for say myself or you know, uh, it took a long time before I started texting because. I love people, but some people just want to text their whole life, and uh, that's a little too, too many, important. too many fingers. Yeah, and then I can't spell to begin with, so I'm glad that now you can do it vocally, you know. But <laughs> and I, I'm a one finger texter. It's like once, uh, where's the letter D? Uh, oh yeah, D for damn a uh, dog. <laughs> You told you told me that you have a show tonight, so your your schedule is just as busy as it's always been. Is that right? No, uh, the show. If we're talking about Temple, yes. that's uh, that's October sixteenth, uh, the day before my birthday, and um, my son's my booking agent, so he's really taking advantage of me. Um, I would. Five weeks nonstop. I said, I'll take a day off tomorrow, but we were touring and uh, it happened that I was in California. I'd leave the bus there, fly home, go to the studio. I was, uh, I actually worked, I think, much better under pressure. I needed to finish the album with my brothers. Um, and uh, uh, it was a last minute thing that I took on because I wanted to finish in time to. Uh, submit to the Grammys. So, um, you know, I make it hard on myself, uh, but there was no time to spare. Uh, every day, something to do, perform, rehearse, lots of rehearsals to put the show together uh, after f finishing the album, which, you know, I, I think I think it turned out really great because of my brothers. But <clears throat> I thought, okay, done. So we just got back from Arizona and uh, yesterday, you know, you come in and take the last minute things after the tour. Uh, and I was looking forward to this today. I said, this is gonna be relaxing for me. I'm not gonna have to talk to anybody else. <laughs> I thought, uh, but then tomorrow, uh, what's, today is Tuesday, yes. Uh, Wednesday, we go get tested, uh, rapid test uh, for the virus, for COVID. Then Thursday, I play the fair in Dallas. Thursday night, I drive, drive past Temple, to go to Austin, catch a flight to Long Beach. They'll pick us up and take us to the ship and get settled in. And I'm playing the cruise there, which I, I'm i happy that I can do this because of the band members and my staff here, they get to go. And, but myself, it's just one long interview. The minute I step out of my cabin, uh, it's like, hey, Joe, by the way, do you remember 1965 when I was sitting there in the second row at the Majestic Theater? He's like, oh. Uh, so I love people, but I like breathing too, you know, just a little breathing time. But uh, I, I know it'll, it, it's always fun. So we'll be on the cruise. And as soon as we get back, we got a day in between to settle in. Then I go play the Chicano Festival in Houston on a Thursday, which is the 42nd. And I was there from the first, and, uh, uh, that the first concert, uh, Chicago Festival, and I've only been absent, I think, once when I was out of the country. Other than that, I've, I've been performing at this festival year after year after year, and it's amazing to see children, you know, 40 years ago, 
uh, and now they're the, these are great grandparents like I am and parents and they still bring their children it's at the Miller Park Theater so I'll do that then I'll drive off to San Antonio to do a special performance for uh, a clinic uh, that's just starting up a medical clinic and finish that and bus on to Pueblo, Colorado. <laughs> well, it's, I'm already tired, but I'm Oh, no, fun. no, no, no. It's obvious that you are still making magic and you plan on making magic for a very, very long time. You know, I didn't, and, I didn't mean to give you all my troubles of my. Point. No, no, no. It's just the opposite. Know, I think people should know that, uh, you know, Showtime, and uh, they don't know where I've been, what I've done, how I'm feeling, what I've gone through. And it doesn't matter. They don't need to know. All they need to know that they want their money's worth, they can going to have fun. And that's all I want to do. Just give them their money's worth and have fun. I, I cannot imagine you sitting on a porch watching birds. <laughs> you can't save the world doing that. And you have a special gift that requires you to do other things. Gracias. And you do it so well. Gracias. <laughs> oh, well. Uh, when, when you're on the ship, just find a little cubbyhole space, wear a really big hat with sunglasses, <laughs> and watch the birds off in the distance. People walk by saying, hey, little Joe, I like your disguise. <laughs> wear a wig. Wear uh, a wig. If they can't see me, they can smell me. Uh, Oh, I've been on the road too long. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Well, speaking of the road, let me, let me give, see if there's anybody who has any questions out there. I know that there are a lot of people that were looking forward to you talking today. So Alyssa, do you have, does anybody, has anybody, if you refresh to see if anybody's had any questions? Let me say this. I didn't do it. <laughs> Somehow I don't believe that. <laughs> oh, I read your book. I totally don't believe that. <laughs> well, if, well, if it's a good thing, I did it my way. You did. You did. I'm very impressed with that. <laughs> oh. So, so Alyssa? Fun? What's yes, the yes, yes. Have fun living it? Or... Yes, yes. <laughs> Did you have, were there yes. any questions? Yes, there were a couple of questions. Oh, okay. Um, so they're going to be tough on you. <laughs> Great. Um, let me see. So the first question is, would your career path be the same without the success of Las Nubes? It's a song I've heard all the time, and it's kind of an anthem in my family. Everyone knows it, and it's always played in happy and sad times. I, I, the beginning of the question, would my... Would your career path be the same without the success of Las Nubes? I can't say because it's there. I do know that I recorded it twice, once at a different tempo. And uh, when I was in uh, the Bay Area, California, and things changed for me. I saw Latinismo that I had never seen here before. And I knew I wanted to change. I changed the name from Latin Airs to Familia. And I changed the music. I took that same song. And I used the symphony strings uh, and just made a different arrangement of it. And, you know, I'm one of the lucky, lucky persons that find our signature piece along the way. I doubt that it would have been the same because this song um, is, is just something that continues to grow. Uh, and it's such a big part of the uh, farm workers uh that uh i don't know that i really doubt it i could say that my career would have been the same i'm sure you know all the other beautiful songs are there but uh las nubes really really just hits something in the people's hearts that you know they, they've grown up with it that it's just a song that uh continues as i said continues to grow Thank you. And was there another question, Alyssa? Yes. Um, let's see. The next one is, what is one thing that is still on your list of things that you want to accomplish? 
Hmm. That I want to accomplish something personal. Uh, unity among my family. And uh, how about unity in Congress? Unity between Republicans and Democrats since we're all humans, you know, close your eyes, who cares what color you are? It's what's in your heart. So I know I'm not gonna accomplish that, but I would like to see it happen. It used to happen 50, 60 years ago. I remember. Awesome. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, next question is, what is your favorite song? My favorite song? Mm -hmm. Jesus. Uh, you know, I love them all. I think songs are like ladies. I love them all, but just can't remember them, you know. Uh, they're Jose Alfredo Jimenez, the greatest songwriter in the world. Any Latin, Hispanic entertainer, singer, that's anyone has recorded. They've, they've all at one time or another recorded Jose Alfredo Jimenez songs. And uh, there are so many, I've done recorded so many of the songs. There's so many beautiful songs he wrote. But uh, there's one particular song that I guess I would lean to as one of my favorites. It's called A uh, She. Thank you. A any other questions? Um, and then I see one more question. Um, we just moved to Temple from El Paso. When are you playing in Temple? Uh, uh, October 16th, it's Saturday. Uh, it's an outdoor event, so you're welcome. And you're from El Chuco, you say? El Paso. That's El Chuco. That's the nickname for El Paso. Mm -hmm. I, that was, that has been like home away from home for me for years and decades and decades. I uh, have so many wonderful friends there, uh, retired politicians and educators and uh, just all kinds of uh, uh, judges and just so many friends and beautiful people that uh, uh, in Barcelona, as I say, it's, it's home away from home. I, I love and the nickname for El Paso is El Chuco, and uh, we're playing their hundredth uh, anniversary for Bowie High School, but that's not till next year. So hope you can return to El Paso for that event. Cool. Cool. So any more questions, Alyssa? Um, when is your new album coming? Pardon? When is your new album coming? Um, we've just set it off uh, to get uh, all the, there's a lot of work in the level together, uh, the cover and all the uh, information a list of authors and just credits and it goes on and on and on. And then of course, the manufacturing that sometimes take a couple of weeks. So I think we've done pretty much all of that. And I think the release date will be the end of the month, the 30th. Oh, very cool. Which is not all that far off, is it? Mm. Uh, wow. No, that's like four days, three days, oh, two wow. days. <laughs> It'll be in the digital stores, uh, so I don't know when it'll be in the uh, regular, if there's any record stores left. And things have changed so much in the uh, in the recording industry, you know, it's like, I uh, was so amazed that cars don't have CD players anymore. It's like, whoa, and I'm looking for a, a cassette player. Is it the, Joel, what's a cassette? <laughs> I'm updated. No, no, no. no. <laughs> Any other questions, Alyssa? No, I think that's it. Um, just a lot of comments saying that they love you and you're such a legend and that they've been listening to you since they were kids. <laughs> Lots of love. How nice. I really appreciate those comments. Muchas gracias. 
Well, and and we appreciate you taking the time from your busy, busy schedule to um, come talk to us. Yes, you are extremely as down to earth as when I called over there and went, hey, you want to come talk to our college? <laughs> well, You're like, sure. Look at it this way. How often do we get chances to brag about ourselves? <laughs> well, you're the most humble bragger I have ever met. <laughs> well, thank you for that comment. But uh, as I said, I love people. I enjoy conversations. And I'm really grateful to you, the way you handled this interview. Is, you were very gracious. And then it was easy for me to open up. And <laughs> Just answer your questions. I appreciate that from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I know why you're loved. I I see it, and I am truly glad that you used your magic <laughs> to make people in this world happy and to give them an outlet for emotion, and so. Thank you. I don't really represent the world, but. <laughs> One last little thing. Don't believe a word I said. <laughs> well, I was getting ready to tell you, stay out of trouble. <laughs> God bless you. Thank you so very, very much. We we'll hope to see you again and soon. Yes, yes. Well, we're we're going to go ahead and um I just want to remind everybody Thursday we've got a night sky tour, so make sure you check with us then. Thank you so much, Mr. Joe D Hernandez, little Joe, for sharing your day with us and um I don't want you to go yet. I'm going to we're going to go ahead and take us out. Um Alyssa's going to take us out and thank you everyone for joining us today and uh, lots of love for um, little Joe. Make sure that you go ahead and follow him. His YouTube videos are awesome. Make sure you read his book. <laughs> we have a copy here at the library. It's great read. So um, you guys have an awesome day. Thank you for joining us and um, we'll see you on Thursday, but don't leave quite yet, little Joe. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Okay, thank you. You take us out.